We're going to start off with race. And uh, race is a specious classification of human beings created by Europeans during a period of, we're talking about American racism. We're not talking about racism in other societies. We're talking strictly about homegrown racism. Created by Europeans during a period of colonial expansion, using themselves as models of humanity and civilization, the utilitarian, utilitarian purpose of the creation of the concept of race is in the maintenance of white power, privilege, and a sense of entitlement. And these are our definitions that we're working with today. You wanna? And we said earlier that in our definition, racism is prejudice plus power. I always knew that something was wrong, but, um, but nobody ever addressed it um, in a way that I felt would give me any kind of direction or understanding in my life until I became a Unitarian Universalist. And, um, and our congregation was one of the first to um, be trained by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond out of New Orleans, which is similar to Crossroads training, which is what Lorena, I'm sorry, Lorena? Laurentia. Laurentia um, was talking about. It's more or less the same kind of training that deals with all the forms of racism. Um, up until that time, I kind of didn't know um, where I belonged, and um, I spent a lot of time with people of color and Latinos, um, very uncomfortable in my own skin, feeling a lot of guilt and angst until I found anti-racism training, which opened my eyes and gave me so much back. Um, it's a slippery slope, it's hard work for white people, and I'm talking to the white people here. Um, I don't see too many of you, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of what happens with anti-racism training. Um, as progressive people, um, we do a lot of good work, but unfortunately, the piece that a lot of white people get stuck on is racism, because there's a denial, um, and there is a sense of um, well, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, I won't go into that now, but um, one of the things I learned is that we as white people shouldn't expect that black people should, or black or other people of color should teach us about racism. We are the perpetuators of racism. We should understand what racism is because we live it, but unfortunately it's an invisible system. So we need to, um, to reclaim our humanity. We need, to, um, we need to take some other steps. And in fact, during the uh, civil rights movement um, at, in SNCC, in um, Waveland? Yeah. In Waveland, um, there were a lot of whites who came to join in the civil rights um, movement and the voter, the voter, uh, voter registration drive. And, um, they were told by um, some of the black brothers and sisters, well, you need to go back to your own communities and work with your own people to end racism. And that kind of shocked a lot of people and we you know like, oh, okay, what are we supposed to do? Um, you can be part of a white organization or a white church or a white group and you can still be an anti-racist. You don't need black people to tell you how to be an anti-racist. You need to do your homework. And it's a process, because racism robs us of our humanity. All of us, not just some of us, but all of us. And there are costs to racism. The costs to racism for white people are largely psychological, spiritual, um, intellectual. Um, and I'm not talking about poor whites who are, um, poor whites experience a different kind of privilege different kind of white privilege, because their privilege is not being blamed for their own poverty. Whereas, you know, by and large, poor African Americans and Latinos, they're poor because it's their own fault, because you're not working hard enough. But whites are generally not blamed for their own poverty on the collective, and we need to remember to look at white people as a collective. It's real easy for this nation to look at black people as uh, this whole monolithic group. But we don't tend to look at whites as a collective. 
We, we white people like to say, well, that's what those white people are like, but I'm not like that. We need to kind of get away from that and claim the responsibility for the benefits of our privilege. We have privilege because other people don't, and it's as simple as that. So um, I just wanted to ask two questions before I go into the definition of white privilege, which we don't have on the overhead. So I'll just read it to you. Um, if you could live your life again, would you do so as a black person? This is the question for the white brothers and sisters out here. You don't have to answer it, just think about it. <laughs> and what do you like about being white? Just some questions to ponder. So, um, so what we strive to do is to be an ally to people of color. We need to learn how to accept leadership of people of color, not always think that we're the ones that are right and we have the answers. We saw a lot of problems in the 60s when uh, Johnson put in the, um, what do you call it, the, uh, the Great, Great Society, Society. <laughs> and all this money started coming in to try to deal with poverty. Most of the people who ran those anti-poverty agencies were white people who did not necessarily understand the communities in which they were supposed to serve. Kind of can do more harm than good. But as, as Nancy mentioned before, we're, all, we're on a different continuum. You know, we're all somewhere different on the continuum of trying to develop an anti-racist personality. The first step for whites is to, first of all, acknowledge white privilege, and then to really delve deeply into it and understand how it works at the personal level, the cultural <coughs> level, the institutional level, and the systemic level. And then we can, we can certainly strive to be allies to people of color, to accept leadership from people of color. This definition comes from a woman named Peggy McIntosh, Maybe some of you have heard of her. Peggy McIntosh um, works out of Wellesley College uh, for research on women, and she developed a whole paradigm for the ways in which women suffer under, the, under male oppression. And then she decided that she could use that same model to apply to, privilege, to white privilege. So she went from male privilege to white privilege, and, and it worked. Um, she's very, very widely quoted um, and her definition is, white privilege can be defined as invisible systems of unearned benefits and advantages that confer dominance on those of European ancestry, people who look like me. And the quote from her is, I see a pattern running through the matrix of white privilege, a pattern of assumptions that were passed on to me as a white person. My skin color was an asset for any move I was educated to want to make. I could think of myself as belonging in major ways and of making social systems work for me. Whiteness protected me from the many kinds of hostility, dis distress, and violence, which I was being subtly trained to visit in turn upon people of color. Um, Peggy McIntosh, gave us this, uh, a list of um, what she was trying to identify the daily, the ways that on, a, on, um, on an everyday <coughs> level, privilege would affect her. And these, these, um, these um, conditions all stem from some system that's in play here. The financial system, the banking system, employment, industry, healthcare, criminal justice, education, housing, real estate, insurance, retail. Okay, we're, I want to keep pulling us back to the systems because that's what's important here. And the social and the cultural. So I'm just going to read you a couple of things that Peggy McIntosh, she says, I can, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. When I am told about our national heritage or about civilization, I am shown that people of my color made it what it is. Getting back into the historical, the authentic history piece, the education piece that we were talking about before. 
Again, I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. Not just a paragraph or a few words in a textbook that comes into your school district under a multi-million dollar contract. I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. If a traffic cop pulls me over, or if the IRS audits my tax return, I can be pretty sure that I haven't been singled out because of my race. I can easily buy posters, pictures, postcards, greeting cards, dolls, toys, children's magazines, featuring people of my race. I can take a job with an affirmative action employer without having co-workers on the job suspect that I got it because of my race. And the list goes on and on. These are the, these are the kinds of ways that, that our consciousness as white people can be raised because you get a different lens. You're seeing the world through a different lens. It's uncomfortable work. It's unsettling. But I do want to emphasize one more thing that it's important when you do anti-racism work, and I don't care who you are, that you do it in a community, preferably a spiritual community, where if you want to cry and carry on, your pe people are going to be around you to support you and take you through whatever it is that you're going through. And very important to build the relationships over time with people while you're doing this work. In other words, you need to be able to trust. There have been instances when I've been with Nancy different places. Remember when we were in Hartford and we went up to the booth and it was like this white guy, he's not talking to Nancy. He, we both were together. That happens a lot. They don't talk, it happened today in Harris Teeter. <laughs> we went in to get the fruit. We went in to get the fruit and the lady, you know, Nancy's the one that's got all the, you know, <laughs> the receipts and the money. And this, this woman is talking to me the whole time. But, I, but these are, what, this is what we need to start to do in order to understand what yeah, She's like, what's she talking to me for? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like a fish in water. The water is all around you and you really don't see it until you start to look at the water and you start to examine it. Self-reflection, self-criticism, study, look at history, be with people who are like-minded, who are questioning. I belong to a group of white people. It's a white support group because we are recovering white people. It's an anti-racist anti right, white It's an anti-racist <laughs> white group, but we are dealing with what are the implications? And what can I do on my job, for instance? Or what can I do in my church or in my synagogue? Or how do I deal with this? How do I deal with the newspaper? Or how do I, it's, and it's, it's really important it, because it is spiritual work. It's your identity. So, um, I, can I go now? Okay. <laughs> your turn. I'm being facetious. I hope you know you that. You are? Okay, yeah. well, I, I just want to let you know that I have um, some handouts here which are not in the overheads. One is called the Stages of White Racial Identity Development. Kind of similar to what Nancy put up at the beginning of the day about moving from a monocultural to a multicultural anti-racist. This is by a woman named Janet Helms who wrote a book called Race is a nice thing to have, a guide to being a white person or understanding the white persons in your life. She's a black woman. So I have the, these are the stages, they're kind of like the stages of grief or different stages of, but this is the stages of developing an anti-racist identity. Then the other one is the cost of oppression. The, the, and well, we don't have time for me to go through this. The psychological cost, Loss of authentic self, loss of who you really are, social costs, you're isolated like me. I was raised in a white suburb. It's like, this is, something's wrong with this. Moral and spiritual costs, going to church and professing to be a spiritual person, and then, well, you see what goes on outside. 
Um, intellectual cost, not, not having um, a full range of knowledge about the world and about your neighbors and about people in the world. And the material cost, um, quality of life. And then also there's a section on the benefits because the benefits are many. Mm -hmm. The benefits are many. The benefits is that you, you come back to who you really are. You're able to form authentic relationships with people. You're able to be honest. You're able to open your heart. You're able to be wrong. You're able to be corrected. And it contributes to democracy, which is what we're supposed to be all about. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about internalized racial, uh, well, internalized racial superiority. Um, first of all, um, when you have a superior, uh, idea, you have a superiority, then you also have a what on the other side? Inferiority. An inferiority. So it's a, a, a complex, you can read this, complex multi-generational process that allows whites to believe, accept, and act upon uh, internalized perception of their own superiority. And we, we see that early on. We know that by the time kids, for example, get to the third grade, they have already, they'll start off in kindergarten uh, black American kids, kids of color, most of the time ahead, very often, of their white counterparts. But by third grade, there is a drop-off. There's a tremendous drop-off. And, and they know, even though people don't like to talk about it, it has to do with the messages that are being internalized about your own inferiority. And kids pick that up. Uh, uh, one of the experiments that was done in education was that um, some little kids, like second grade, I think, were taking a math test, and uh, a little one of the students was a, a, a black female, and she got a hundred on her math test, and another student, a little white boy, was like, he was astounded. Well, how could she do that? Because the assumption is that he should have been the one hundred percent student, not her. So those messages are already in place mm -hmm. from almost actually at the time of birth, and maybe even before birth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So um, internalized racial superiority has been supported by pseudoscientific ideology, and we know that we've had pseudoscientific stuff that was written in books, and we all assume that when something goes in a book, you know, hey, if it's in a book, it must be legitimate. Mm -hmm. Well, that is not true, and, I, and one of the one of the funny things that, uh, it's not funny, it's pathetic, um, that was uh, a science um, in, a, in, a, in the 18th uh, and 9th, 18th century, uh, during the time of, of the enslavement of, of people of color, was that um, there was a term that was a, allegedly a medical term, and uh, I can't think of the name of it Drape, now. Drape, Drape, Drape Domania. How many of you ever heard of Drape Domania? Okay, I know you would. <laughs> Drapetomania was a term given to a black person who would keep running away from being enslaved. Mm -hmm. They were suffering with drapetomania. Mm -hmm. Scientific terminology, how ridiculous, how ridiculous. And yet we still do the same thing even today. So, mm -hmm. so don't assume because it's in a book, and we're going to be doing a little bit more of that, how things are in books and make us shape us and form us to see things in a particular way. The ideology of internalized racial superiority justifies domination, subjugation, dehumanization, and misrepresentation of oppressed groups for economic and political gain. And that's what it's always been about. The justification for enslaving people was based on economics. The justification for making people seem uh, uh, inferior it was based on economics. If you take from someone, you have to justify it in yourself. I want to talk a little bit about internalized racial oppression because that is the piece that affects people who look like me. All right? Now, internalized racial oppression is a complex, multi generational, multi generational process that teaches people of color to believe, accept, and or live out negative societal perceptions and definitions of themselves. Those behaviors help support and maintain the race-based social construct under which we live. Who would disagree with this definition? 
black people only may speak. <laughs> no, because we are the ones who suffer as a people with internalized racial oppression. When, and when it's being, um, uh, we come to believe and act as if the oppressors believe belief system and their values and their way of life is reality. It, that we become, we come to accept as the norm. So nobody wants some, uh, I'll give you some that aren't just racial, some things that, that are examples of self-hate or inter internalized racism. Um, I'll do one for women. Mm -hmm. How many of you have ever heard, women need to know their place. That is an oppress, oppressor's way of allowing for violence, isn't it? Yes. It's a, a way of perpetrating. And how many women, when we have a vice presidential candidate who really kind of probably believes that, or oh, I don't know what her place is, but she doesn't believe in women's health, <laughs> that women have the right to determine their own health issues, is that, am I right? right? Something to think about. Uh, invalidating our children, and I, I, this is something that is painful to me, that we carry, many of, many of us, the internalized slave message that our children have to be treated fiercely, um, that we have to be fierce with each other, that we can't be loving and kind to each other. We carry those slave messages, beat him. I always remember from... Um, uh, this movie, uh, The Color Purple, and the story of The Color Purple, uh, the woman, Seely, uh, when the son, how many of you saw that movie? Everybody saw that movie, at least on TV, right? When uh, her son-in-law um, would fight against the wife, uh, that's the part that Oprah Winfrey played. Sophie. Harpo, yeah, right, Sophia. Yeah. And um, he couldn't manage her. He couldn't, he came from a very brutal, now his father's coming at, out of enslavement, so a very brutal life, been brutalized as, as enslaved people. And Celie herself had come from an extremely brutal background. And what is the advice that she gave to that son-in-law? She said, be her. Because the oppressed become the oppressors. And, and we see that, I see it, uh, I don't, not so much in Fayetteville, but in the Northeast where I come from, where women curse their children, African American women, black women, call them all kinds of names, disparage them, uh, feel that if I had a, a and, and whites think you should do that often. I remember a gentleman who was an anti-racist white man said to me, um, my son was a pretty active little boy when he was young. And uh, this man said to me, you know, I've never seen you beat him. And I thought to myself, you're not supposed to see me beat my son, you know. <laughs> Why should I beat my son for your benefit? But a lot of us have internalized that message that our children have to be oppressed and they have to be treated fiercely and it's, a, and it's important that we straighten them out. Mm -hmm. Now, that may have been a protective device at some point. Mm -hmm. And I taught my son to be very careful when he was driving uh, when he started driving, or to because as a as a, a young man of color, to to keep his uh, license and all that up above, not go for, to the glove compartment for his license. Should the police pull him over, we should not have to do that. But I had to teach him that because I did not. I love him, and I didn't want him to be killed inadvertently uh, in, in innocence because we still live in that oppressive society in many ways. But some of those things are very dangerous to us internally as a people. Um, yeah, I was gonna mention her. Um, so it's a mythical idea of the majority and, um, that, and, and we've accepted that. We accept in many ways that our skin is too dark, our hair is too kinky. We say kinky, I, I call it super curly. Um, you know? But, and that's, you know, I think that's a beautiful thing. What's wrong with that? And that is part of who we are. That is part of who many of us look like or not. Um, so we need to recognize these patterns of internalized oppression in ourselves and in others and remind ourselves to check ourselves. Check yourself. I've been as much a victim. I have called people 
the, the word that is now forbidden to be said. Um, <laughs> because that was a part of the culture of, of what you grew up in. That's what you hear. And, and I think that people will probably still use that word because there's a difference between what I call home language and cash language. And we need to teach our children that. I have teach, I've seen teachers who didn't teach students, did not correct their English and allowed them to use home language in the schools I taught in, which were 99% kids of color. Um, so the teachers would let them use incorrect English, allow them to write uh, incorrectly. And sometimes uh, they would do it well, it's their culture. Well, those things are not our culture. Our culture is the American culture. It's the American culture. There are subcultures and there are things that you can possess. I've heard young people, I, I heard I think Beth talking about the hip hop thing. A lot of times we feel, well, this is black culture and I'm only gonna listen to black culture. And if you listen to something different, uh, like elevator music, which I listen to, or classical music, then you're not being genuinely and authentically uh, black. Oh, well, that's an oppression. That is an oppression. And it's an impression of, I'll reject all this because I'm being authentically black. There is no, or there's very little that is authentically black anymore because everything that, that African people brought here and the things that natives gave have now become a part of the American landscape. They're a part of being American. Um, it reminds me of a time when I uh, went to a powwow in, uh, in Jersey. They have uh, native powwows, you know. And I said, I'm gonna go up and see what's going on, you know, because I know that, uh, you know, somewhere that all of us have something, some, some native in us. If my blue-eyed friend in the back there has, has native in him. And um, I, I wanted to try some native food. Well, it was the same food that my mother used to cook. It was just food, you know, it was, it was American food. Uh, it was um, sweet potatoes fried, which was, you know, it's like, this is not Indian food yet. Yeah, this is native food, because it's the food that is a part of America. So some of the questions we may want to ask ourselves is, um, what is good about being black? And if you think there's nothing, then you got a, a way to go. You're way down on the end of the continuum. <laughs> no. <laughs> Also, uh, what makes me proud of being black? And I kind of resent that question because again, that's a collectivism. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I think we need to move away from is the whole theory of uh, hypodescent. And that's the theory that if you have one drop of black blood, you are black because that is just not so. Most people in America are actually what I would call Creoles. They're people of th three or four races and American born. Hypodescent was used to keep people enslaved. That one drop rule was to keep people enslaved and many of us still go by that rule. If I have one drop, I'm black. Well, you're not really. And you know, you are really an American and you're really probably many things. That doesn't mean you can't embrace all of your cultures. And I think we can reach out and embrace all of our cultures. Um, ask ourselves how, and these are internal questions, how have I been hurt by my own people? And a lot of times uh, we as people of color are responding to how we've been hurt by our own people, how we've been rejected, and you know, you know what we say. You now, so and so can't do anything for me. You know, we have that. That's a form of internalized oppression. Um, think about when someone of color who was unrelated to you stood up for you, rather than attacking. When did I begin to feel, and these are questions to ask yourself, when did I begin to feel resistance to um, the idea of internalized oppression? And a lot of times the resistance that we are expressing, and particularly when you're young, is 
sometimes detrimental to you, but it is resistance nonetheless. A lot of times young people are resisting the boxes that we are putting them in. They may not be able to understand it fully, articulate it, but they are resisting and they are resenting it. And so they are acting in a particular way to show that. Um, but what they're really adopting are things that sometimes are harmful to them, uh, whether it's escaping into different kinds of activities that are unhealthy. But it often is a, 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 a resistance that is destructive. And what I think the biggest thing that people of color have to do is move beyond being victims. There's kind of a resentment, you know, when you walk, somebody said one time, as a black American, if you're in some place, wherever it is, and people think, they kind of look at you as though you may, you're not supposed to be there, you're supposed to be any place that you are. And that's kind of, it seems like an arrogant way, and maybe it is, but that's, moving beyond being a victim or feeling embarrassed or feeling that I don't belong. You have the right, you have the responsibility to be everything you can be. And that's what we need to show our children, talk to our brothers and sisters, our mothers and so on. Uh, and when I'm in stores, one of the things I do is, um, I remember when I was a little kid, you know, it was as though little white kids were always cute. You know, but words of beauty for black kids just weren't there. It was like your hair was nappy, or somebody told me when I was a little kid, mm, she's my writing. Or, you know, those, they were always negatives. And I, when I see little kids of color in a supermarket, whatever on the street, I always tell them how beautiful they are. You are so beautiful, and you are so smart because they don't hear those messages, and, I, and our children need to hear them, and we need to hear them. We need to hear them as black people. So I'm talking to, to people of color and black people about what you need to do to help overcome internalized oppression. You may seem a little too haughty at times when you first come into your own about it, but it's okay. It's okay, because that kind of confidence, believe you me, Europeans walk around this society feeling like that's who they are and that's they have that confidence and, and their way of life is the best while they've taken many many things away from you so um i i want to i guess the other thing i want to say is in, li in we need liberation movements and we have to work in coalition because part of moving along this continuum, the only time there have been really successful changes in this society have been when people worked in coalition with each other. And I've moved personally from being a separatist to understanding that without coalition in this culture, you will not be successful, more than likely. You will not be successful. Um, you want transformation and um, you, ha you will get results from confronting the oppression that is in this society. Um, stay away, I tell young people, sometimes you think what is keeping it real is really being very harmful because what you say is keeping it real may not be real. And I wanted to say that because I know there were students here today and a lot of, I've had my students say to me in the past, you know, we just keeping it real, Ms. Shacker. We just keeping it real. I'm like, uh-uh, that is not keeping it real. I told them, nah-uh, that is not keeping it real. What you're doing is hurting yourself. So overcome being a victim, uh, step up. Okay, I want you to read this um, and talk about cheaper unpaid labor, source, politically disenfranchised, all those things. Oversex, contributing to overpopulation. Everybody see those? Mm -hmm. Who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Come on, come on. Come on out with it. Who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? We're talking about black men? Who are we talking about? No one said white people. Which, which, which white one? People? White males. Which one? This is a particular group of people. Huh? Think about this okay. struggle that's still going on today across All the right. pond. When we look at this, these are exactly the terms, and most black people in here say, when you're talking about black people, this is the English describing the Irish. 
This is the English describing the Irish, exactly. And even calling the Irish a, a race, different race. A different race, a separate race. How do you justify a separate race that you're oppressing? Through this, the colonialism and the exploitation of the land in Ireland. Right. So the same thing has been done to people of color in this society. Exactly the same thing in order to exploit and for economic purposes. You become all these things. So the first thing you need to do is begin washing yourselves, washing your mind of the belief of these things. Because that's a projection. Somebody looks uncomfortable with that. Somebody looks real comfortable with it. <laughs> a couple of people. <laughs> all right, we're gonna, I'm moving fast. This is, is what is done to subjugated groups. When people subjugate, they justify the subjugation and, they, and, th and this is what they project onto the persons or group that they're subjugating. Now, back in the 60s, there was a uh, movement to, to move into more um, um, on the college level, um, African American studies, women's studies, Latino studies, studies of people other than white European Americans. And um, that's all, it's all very well and good. Um, but what this um, traditional approach to multiculturalism, which also moved over into the public school district, district really focuses on um, heroes and holidays. It's not as substantive as anti-racist multiculturalism. I wish we had the T-chart. Um, let me just move into schools now. Um, and I know many of you have had experience with the public school system as we have had. Um, in the traditional multiculturalism, um, the, the histories, the authentic histories, the lives are not integrated into the curriculum. They're seen as add-ons. Um, and um, the European perspective is still seen as the norm. Um, as with Black History Month in February, which many schools, that's the only time that they look at Black History Month, um, they focus on the most famous people, but never on um, the lesser known people or people who are still alive today. Um, and, and what this really amounts to is ethnic cheerleading, which is very nice. And you get kind of these images of everybody holding hands and making nice. And so celebrating Kumbaya, who culture, said that? <laughs> celebrating so culture, Kumbaya. but nothing really changes. The power dynamic never changes. It's very limited. And um, it doesn't really delve into what produces the inequality. And it's really kind of a feel good, you know, you get that warm and fuzzy feeling. And then also there's this um, idea that if you teach little black and Latino kids about their culture, somehow it's going to improve their self-esteem. Well, I believe that their self-esteem is improved by, by that, but also by success, because nothing succeeds like success and really getting them engaged and involved and having success in the classroom. Well, let me just say one thing. What? You know the celebrations you have where people dress up and they bring ethnic foods and you share that? Mm -hmm. That's kind of traditional multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. Anti-racist anti multiculturalism is a little different and goes a little further, so now. It, yeah, it, it, it moves in, um, it, it seeks to give more of a historical context to multiculturalism, giving a history of immigration or a deep history of slavery, of um, enslaved people in this country. <coughs> and it's part of the regular curriculum. It's part of the textbooks. Right. Now, speaking of textbooks, because um, um, I know that we're running out of I time, know. I want to go to something. I want to show you a difference in the way textbooks and some of you are in education and psychology and you're studying. I compared three textbooks that are used for history and it talks about Rosa Parks. In the first one, it says that Rosa Parks was tired. How many of you know that story? That was it, her feet hurt, she was tired and this thing, this thing just happened. I know it's a lie. Um, okay, so then we'll go to another textbook example and it, it gives a little, more in, a little more information. And um, it talks about the fact 
She refused to ride the buses. They planned to keep up. But it wasn't because she was tired. It doesn't even tell you that she was an activist. She was a, uh, she had segre uh, desegregated, um, uh, she had taken students when it was still segregation laws on the books. She took uh, students, black students into areas, into see exhibits where blacks were not allowed. They don't tell you that. They tell you her, her feet hurt and she was tired and she didn't want to get up on the bus. She was an organizer. Her people, her husband never traveled without a gun. Some of you think that. But there are people and there's some wonderful, wonderful people who resisted, resisted and continued. So the thing I'm pointing out in this, and I know I'm rushing it, is that as teachers, those of you who are going to be working with students, that when you read these uh, textbooks, I, I'm, I was primarily a history teacher, you want to look into what is being said because you can get a totally different picture. Mm -hmm. It just, this bus boycott just happened. No, it didn't just happen. There was strategy and planning in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were people who had been working on that for a long time. And so it, it seems as though, oh gee, what happened? Black people just blew up. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> What's wrong with them? <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. And you need to know that. And, it's, and, and I, I really focus that to educators to look into the studies and present it even if the book, and that's again, these books are not always accurate. Pre look into that and, and, and present that information so that you see the resistance, the proactiveness of all people. It is not just out of the blue that it happened. Yeah, right? I, I, I'd like to mention the way that we deal with uh, Columbus Day mm. and Thanksgiving in relation to Native people. Right. It is, I mean, I get crazy every September because the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, there's no talk about genocide. There's no talk about exploitation of the land. Um, and the same with Thanksgiving. There's no history of, of who they call Squanto. Squanto was the name given him by the Europeans. Right. His name was Tisquantum. And um, as teachers, we have a responsibility to teach the children what really went on. Right. Well, you know, you might say, well, it's really hard to teach kids about genocide. If you really want to teach them, you will find a way because they deserve to know. Mm -hmm. And that's contributing to the perpetuation of racism. Okay, yeah. real fast, and yeah. this we're going to close out on code words. Code Some words. words that are, yeah. Well, so can you go past that one? Oh, language, yeah, we'll pass. Language is not neutral. Oh. And that's something to just keep in mind. Language is never neutral. Mm -hmm. Language forms and shapes loaded. what is loaded. And we, I think many of us have seen this, certainly in this presidential election, yeah. like oh, that one over somebody there. Somebody talked about, um, his, about um, Obama's teeth. Did anyone hear that yesterday? I, they said he, so had, he had uh, a nice smile. He, had, um, yeah. he could speak really well, and he had nice teeth. But uh, Chris, Chris Matthews set him straight. Even the word race is a code word, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Because when you say, well, yeah, we have a problem with race or racist, what they really mean is racism. Don't say race, because race in itself is not a problem. The fact that we look different and our lives are different, that's not the problem. The problem is racism. Mm -hmm. So I get a little nuts over that. Well, how are these words, You let's take slave and enslaved. A slave implies a state of being, that maybe you're born a slave. That it, that it just... It objectifies. It objectifies it. But slavery, but enslaved, because we get out of the passive voice and we come into the active voice. Something happened. Mm -hmm. Something happened. Some action happened to create a person who is enslaved. A slave is a thing, but an enslaved person is a human being. So people were enslaved. And as long as we're teaching in school about the slaves, there is no humanity there. Be, they become obje objects. And there's no They agent. were people. They were children. I saw the shackles that were brought up from the Henrietta, the ship uh, mm -hmm. that sunk off the coast. And, and the shackles were this big because, and I mean, it, it drove me kind of crazy because those were children. Mm -hmm. Those were babies because they're easy to capture. So when you see that, you see, you say, and they weren't slaves. Those were children. Those were human beings that were being taken. 
Same thing with, the, what's the difference between a massacre and a victory? It depends on who's, whose side you're on. <laughs> yeah. um, a gang and fraternity, something that Russell Simmons referred to, a gang and a fraternity, a group of people who are together for a purpose. A tribe and an ethnic group. And when you say tribe, right away, you know who we're talking about. Uh, or somebody of color. But we, yeah, we're never talking about Europeans mm -hmm. when we say the tribe. But they were tribes. The tribes, I mean, the Goths, the Vandals. Come on. Hmm? The Saxons. The Saxons. <laughs> All right. The, uh, the barbers. But see, the barbarians. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's where these words came from. Rebels and freedom fighters. Won't even go there. Yep. Patriots and terrorists. Oh. Who says, oh? <laughs> well, I mean, it's self-explanatory. Yeah. But, but, you know, seeing these words in opposition is kind of interesting. Okay. So, oh, we, uh, uh, sniper and sharpshooter. Yeah. <laughs> um, collateral damage and loss of life. Yeah. Um, the officer's bullet killed the suspect. Versus the officer, uh, the suspect shot, shot by an officer. We're using, um, oh, they're here. Okay. Yeah, they're up. Oh, telephone solicitation and courtesy call. I had to put that one in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Do we have code words here too? Are we? Yeah, we did that. No. At risk. Minority is a code word. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a code but word. But guess what? Pretty soon. People who look like me are going to be the minority in about 35 or 40 years. So that word needs to change. 